WVTM 13 News begins with breaking news. And just into the newsroom, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office believes it has found the body of a missing person from Birmingham. We're told an abandoned vehicle was found yesterday afternoon on Dewey Heights Road near Pinson. The remains were found not too far from a 1999 Honda Civic. We are told that it appeared that someone tried to cover up the car. At this point, law enforcement has not confirmed the remains, but we do want to point out Birmingham police did issue a missing persons alert for Jewel Bendoff just a few days back. We have learned he got into an argument at a gas station in the Mason City neighborhood in South Birmingham. That was Saturday. At the time, he was driving a silver 1999 Honda Civic. Also breaking from Birmingham's Eastwood neighborhood, a pedestrian struck at the Walmart on Montclair Road. We're told that two people were taken to the hospital, including the driver of the car. Further details have not been provided. And more breaking news from Washington. The Supreme Court will hear arguments in Donald Trump's presidential immunity case next month. The date officially announced for April 25th. He's facing charges of conspiracy to defraud the U.S. and conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. The former president argues he is immune from prosecution because he was acting as president at the time. More breaking news to get to right now. Less than 24 hours after winning the District 7 Republican primary, Christian Horn is out. The Alabama GOP says that he dropped out of the race last month. Even so, on Tuesday, he defeated Robin Lydecker by 16 points. The party says it was too late to remove his name from the ballot. Because of that, Lydecker now moves on to the general this fall. In Washington, the House just passed a $460 billion package of spending bills. This keeps key federal agencies running for the rest of the fiscal year. It now goes to the Senate, where lawmakers will take up the issue before the Friday night deadline. All right, so we're getting a little bit of a break, it seems like, from the rain today. But, Taylor, we got a lot to talk about heading toward the weekend. We do have more rain on the way and impact day on Friday. That's when we've got that widespread rain and some thunderstorms moving into central Alabama. But for now, we are enjoying the view from our WVTM 13 studio camera. Those clouds, as advertised, did break up and we're seeing a little bit of blue sky there. We're dry through the rest of this evening and dry through the day tomorrow. Breaking down the rest of the evening, hour by hour, temperatures will be falling from the 60s into the 50s by early tomorrow and we could have some patchy fog around for the morning commute. Wanted to show you some of the modeling on the visibility by 3 a.m. Starting to see that fog build in across our northeasternmost communities that spread southward. So just keep in mind you might need a few extra minutes as you're headed out the door tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon, absolutely beautiful. We end up in the mid 70s under a partly to mostly sunny sky. Friday is our impact day, so we are looking at widespread rain and some thunder flash flooding possible with rainfall totals anywhere from one to three inches widespread across the state. And we do have a low end severe risk to talk about as well. So a lot of details to get to in that Friday forecast. Got more coming up in just a few. Taylor, thank you. Tonight we're expecting votes on two of the most highly talked about bills in the state legislature. So the House is set to discuss the DEI bill that would allow colleges and universities to drop their diversity program if they so choose. That will follow a potential vote on IVF protections. You may recall the state Supreme Court ruled embryos can be considered children under state law. Three facilities in the state paused in vitro fertilization treatments. As a result, it left families who are counting on those treatments in limbo. The bill gives protections for the people who provide in vitro services. If this gets the go ahead, it goes to the governor's desk. If and when she signs it, the bill would go into law effective immediately. Here's a live look at the House floor. The meeting just beginning. We're not sure what time those bills will be discussed. We are uh, keeping a very close eye on this, though. We can tell you that the House goes into recess tomorrow. Representatives will not be back until the 19th. A huge change is to tell you about in the gaming bill that's now on the Senate floor, uh, Senate floor bound. It passed committee yesterday. This version is much different than what was passed in the House last month. Remember those potential 10 casinos? Well, those would be dropped to six and they wouldn't really be casinos. So no electric gaming would be allowed. Instead, it would be betting on horse and dog races. Right, so betting on sports also taken out of the mix there. Keep in mind the lottery is still in this form of the bill. Proceeds initially go to the general fund. If this gets a green light in the Senate, it would have to go back to the House for consideration. Keep in mind, this is a constitutional amendment. So if both chambers pass it, if the governor signs it, then you have to approve it. You get that decision this coming November. On the campaign trail, Alabama will have a new Supreme Court Justice, Sarah Stewart, taking the GOP primary in a landslide. She faces Democrat 
uh, Greg Griffin in the general election. That's this fall. Right now, he's a circuit judge in Montgomery. Four other seats were also up for grabs. Right, a couple runoffs to pass along for you this afternoon. Democrats trying to flip the seat in District 2. Shamari Figures and State Representative Anthony Daniels going to square off on the Democratic side. On the GOP, former Senator uh, Dick Brubaker will match up against Caroline Dobson. All right, so we are down to two now in the race for the White House. Nikki Haley officially dropping out after Super Tuesday. Republican lawmakers are now lining up behind the former president. Meanwhile, President Biden hopes his State of the Union resignates, um, reignites his campaign. Malice Barr has more. A head-to-head -head Biden Trump rematch is now underway in what will be one of the longest general election campaigns for president in modern history. Former President Trump becoming the presumptive Republican nominee after his sole GOP rival Nikki Haley dropped out today. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. Haley, who served as U.N. ambassador in the Trump administration, congratulated but did not endorse her former boss. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. Mr. Trump on social media saying Haley had gotten trounced and inviting her supporters to join him. President Biden quickly pointing to past Trump comments that anyone who contributed to Haley's campaign would be permanently barred from the MAGA camp. In his own outreach to Haley voters, the president saying, quote, you don't have to agree with me on everything to know MAGA extremism is a threat to this country. On Capitol Hill, holdout GOP lawmakers lining up to endorse former President Trump, most notably the Senate's top Republican Mitch McConnell, who's had a fraught Trump relationship. The only representative who endorsed Haley moving quickly to back Trump. 100 percent. We got a country to say. The former president in his Super Tuesday victory speech last night taking President Biden head on. As the president prepares for tomorrow night's State of the Union address, a chance to sell his accomplishments to the nation and try to boost his re-election bid. Even though Haley's departure unofficially kicks off the general election campaign, primaries will continue with voters heading to the polls in Georgia next Tuesday. Both President Biden and former President Trump are set to campaign in Georgia this weekend. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. And we have made it very simple. If you missed any results from Super Tuesday, just open up our free WVTM 13 app. You can click on the commitment section. We have results from statewide and county races, all at the push of a button. A body found in Tuscaloosa County could be a man who's been missing for a week now. That man was found in the Hurricane Creek area yesterday. At this point, it's believed that it is Stephen Sierke. He was last seen the night of February 25th. The State Department of Forensic Sciences is going to determine if it is in fact him. We have not been told if foul play is expected. The Birmingham City Council could soon see a draft of new regulations for short-term rentals, such as Airbnb. So the council is working with the city attorney and other departments to craft those regulations. This all comes from concerned citizens. Just last weekend, someone was shot and killed at a rented home. Council President Daryl O'Quinn says that it's really important to have a permitting process in place to keep short-term rental owners accountable. We have more from the council president. That's coming up for you in about 20 minutes. The State Department of Corrections will use nearly $150,000 to help combat cell phone contraband in Alabama prisons. So the ADOC says confiscations of such devices has gone up by 60 percent from 2019 to 2022. This money, this grant is going to fund the department's uh, brand new digital forensic unit. It uses technology to identify evidence of criminal activity, also has access to tools that can take data and lock cell phones. A former North Alabama sheriff convicted on theft and ethics charges could be paroled tomorrow. Mike Blakely spent 38 years as the law enforcement lead in Limestone County. He was sentenced to three years back in 2021. Right now, Blakely is serving time in Franklin County. Last fall, he was found in violation of his work release program. Don't forget, we spring forward this weekend. Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville continues to push the Sunshine Protection Act. It would make daylight saving time a permanent fixture in the U.S., State lawmakers already passed a similar bill, but this can't go into effect until it's passed by Congress. So just about every state still observes daylight saving. Alabamians are tired of changing their clocks twice a year. They just want consistency. You know, studies have proven that daylight saving time has many significant health benefits. The extra daylight in the evening can encourage people to be more active, 
and spend more time outdoors, which can lead to better health and well-being. It's time for America to move forward and stop falling back. The senator has introduced the same legislation three times. It has failed to get a vote each go around. I hate to admit this, but I never changed my clock in the car, so I'm, I'm ready to go. So you're ready for Overly this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Birmingham Barons, they're back in town in less than a month. Look at this live look outside at Regions. Uh, the boys of summer will be hitting some home runs before we know it. Looks really nice out there. Hey, with the new season comes one of our favorite traditions of the year. We let you know all about the new menu options at the ballpark. All right, so there's some doozies this year to go check <laughs> out. Uh, some interesting ones. You got the Barons Big Baker or the Triple B. This is a picture right here. You got a baked potato, brisket, cheese, sour cream, onions, all topped with some bourbon sauce. How about that? Mm, I'll take that. Uh, next up, the Junkyard Hog. This is a pork rinds with brisket. Queso, it's topped with maple bacon uh, sauce and also topped with jalapenos. That's pretty good. Spicy. All right, so we got a foot long chili cheese hot dog for you. There are jalapenos on it. It's optional. You can have them hold the jalapenos. Probably a good idea. Or just dump them right on there. Why not? <laughs> hey, prepare your belly for this one. A Polish sausage dog with peppers and onions. And we got dessert for you. How about fried cinnamon rolls? Ooh. Now we're talking sweet vanilla icing. Another a uh, couple other assorted toppings come with this one, but that's good. That looks good. Some, some cinnamon rolls. That's what, not bad. What's your vibe at the ballpark? I go for the burger. The hot dog is just easy. <laughs> Pretty true. You know? like chicken fingers, yeah. french fries. Something you can still kind of watch the game, keep an eye on the kids and still eat. You always got to try something new, right? Yeah. Those, uh, those desserts look pretty good. All right, let's take a look on the roads here. Uh, we're looking okay at this hour, seeing our backups in the normal spot. 65 southbound, we're getting a little busy. 459, same story as well. No accidents or incidents, that's some great news. So let's take a live look outside. 280, how about near Grandview Parkway? This is pretty typical. Um, basically sitting still here at this location, which is um, usual for this hour. We'll let you know if any accidents pop up. You can always check out our app too. We have a traffic section if you are on the road. At least it's sunny out. We'll take it. Yeah, Roll down your windows. There you and go. Sing some tunes. Hey, so every once in a while, uh, stray animals, they may pop up around your house in your yard. So imagine this guy, a 450 pound, pound pig comes to say hello. What do you do? Well, if you're a family in Wisconsin, you open up the door and you say, come on inside. <laughs> But next, a wild situation in Las Vegas. What else is new? A man filing suit, claiming a scorpion delivered a sting right to the mailbox. I put my eyeglasses and then I was in shock that I have a scorpion over there just hanging on my underwear.
All right, a California man is claiming a hotel in Vegas. Drop the ball. Yeah, so he says a scorpion somehow got into his room and then uh, stung him in a very sensitive area while he was sleeping. Michael Farchi says he woke up the day after Christmas in pain. To make matters worse, uh, the scorpion was still there. Still, still right there, he says the sting uh, there caused some lingering medical issues down the road. It is traumatizing until now, even today. I'm going to bed. I'm checking the I'm checking the covers and everything. All right, so it's not known what exact type of scorpion it was or the toxicity of the venom. Does that hurt like, reading this story <laughs> and assuming the resort for uh, damages of an unspecified amount? Not a good story. Yeah. yeah, from a scorpion wrestling in a man's uh, undergarments to a girl making wrestling history in Minnesota. So as a freshman, uh, Kaylee Graber won a state in the women's division, but that wasn't enough. Uh, Danny Spivak explains uh, what she did for an encore this year. You know, really, I love the sport. Sophomore Callie Graber's climb to the varsity wrestling team at Northfield High didn't happen by accident. Well, I started wrestling when I was about four years old because my older brother wrestled. And yeah, from there, I just fell in love with the sport. Last year, Callie won state at the girls tournament as a freshman. And then this year, I wasn't sure if I was going to do girls or boys. I really wanted to challenge myself against the boys, so decided to go for it, and it turned out pretty well. That is an understatement. And from Northfield, Kelly Graber. Last Friday, Graber made history by becoming the first female wrestler in Minnesota history to defeat a male opponent in a state high school match. Being the first, has that sunk in yet for you? Yeah, it, it's been crazy. Um, yeah, it's really, really exciting to know that I'm the first and hopefully the first of many to come. Callie won two more times over the weekend and that's going to be the match to finish in fifth place. Absolutely incredible. You know, it's just a wonderful thing to see somebody competing with their heart and soul out there. Jules Dalvaskar coached Callie this year as an assistant. I think it's a great thing for girls wrestling. I think it shows that you don't have any limits except the ones you put on yourself. Callie's performance could open new doors. Breaking the ground for all these youth girls that are growing up in the world of wrestling. Over the past three years, girls' participation in the sport has quadrupled, with more than 1,000 competing statewide this season. Amazing to show them that, you know, we can compete with the boys and they can do just as much as those boys can. As Danny Spiewak reporting, she's amazing. Hey, we want to wish a happy birthday to everyone's favorite cookie. On this day back in 1912, the Oreo was introduced in New York. Uh, so popular, in fact, that the name was trademarked just six days later. Hey, we did some research for you to find out which cookie we like best here at WVTM. Oh, we have headshots too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I prefer the quadruple stuffed. I think some people call it the, uh, the mega stuff. Yeah. Ian, what was your see. vote? I like the mint one. Those are pretty good. You guys had those? You would like the toothpaste one. It's yeah. not toothpaste. It's kind of like the Thin Mint, you know, got that mint flavor. Taylor? Well, I put that I like double stuff, but I kind of want to revise my answer. Okay. I think that my favorite kind is inside a milkshake. Oh, Ooh. that is good. Yes. That's a really yeah. good option. That's good. Milkshake, or on, so. top, yeah, on top of ice yeah, cream yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, 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 a, go. good that's a good call. That's a very good call. All right, we got rain to talk about and a lot of it, in fact, heading into Friday. A lot. We have an impact day on Friday. We are watching for some flooding and yep. a very low end chance to see a few strong storms. Here's what we look like right now. This is from our Chiha camera. This is the highest point in Alabama, and we are seeing a clearing trend across the state. Those clouds are moving on out of here. And through the rest of the evening, we are going to be mainly clear with temperatures dropping from the mid 60s around 6 p.m. into the upper 50s by 10 p.m. Early tomorrow, our temperatures will be in the 40s and 50s. And I do want to point out we could have some patchy fog around, so keep that in mind. If you're making your plans to head out the door, you might need just a few extra minutes. And we want to remind you, of course, do not use your high beams in the fog for tomorrow. After we have that foggy start with chilly temperatures in the upper 40s, low 50s, we end up in the mid 70s under a mostly sunny sky tomorrow. Absolutely beautiful. Friday is when we do bring in those weather changes. Widespread rain and thunder. It's an impact day. That's because we could have average rainfall across our part of the state anywhere from one to three inches. Some localized spots pick up even more than that. Some flooding could become an issue by Friday evening, and we are once again also monitoring a low end severe risk. 
In terms of our rainfall totals, the zone that you see in the red here is where we're expecting anywhere from two to four inches. We could have some pockets of even higher totals within that, within that zone as well. And it's within that red region where we have the highest risk to see some flash flooding. So we're talking anywhere from I-20 to the I-85 corridor across the central part of the state is where we're most concerned with that flooding risk. Very low end marginal level one out of five risk for severe storms across central Alabama. That's the green color there. The better threat for any kind of strong to severe storms looks to hold to our southwest across southwest Alabama. Southern Alabama closer to the coast is where we expect that better instability. But nevertheless, we are going to pay attention to those storms on Friday evening lasting into Saturday morning. If we can have a strong storm or two across our part of the state, main threats Damaging winds up to 60 miles per hour can't completely rule out an isolated brief tornado and once again watching for that heavy rain threat. So I did want to time it out for you. This is 6 a.m. on Friday. We're still dry at that point. We've got clouds around watching storms to our west. Those storms do move into our state around lunchtime. They're going to move into West Alabama first and then spread across central Alabama through the afternoon and evening hours. This is a look towards dinner time, heavy rain in some locations. And as we approach the later evening hours, about 9 p.m., that's when we have to monitor for a few strong storms. Remember the overall threat of severe storms, very low, but it's not zero. So it's important that you have a way to get warnings just in case they're needed late Friday, lasting into early on Saturday. Rain will exit during the morning hours on Saturday and the weekend does look mainly dry and cooler. We've got a high on Saturday in the upper 60s. And then as we head into Sunday, we're mainly clear, a very chilly start, followed by a high near 60 degrees. And don't forget those, to set those clocks forward Saturday night into Sunday. Stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome in. Thanks so much for being here with us. We're taking a look at the roads uh, right now. We don't have any accidents to report. That's some great news. 65 southbound. We're looking busy in the normal spots. 
20 eastbound. Now we're also seeing some slow moving traffic right around 19 mile an hour average speeds there. And of course, Highway 280, we showed you a picture of that not long ago. Um, very slow moving as of uh, pretty typical as we head into the evening rush hour commute. Live look outside 65. This is right near 3rd Avenue. Traffic is flowing just fine here this afternoon. It looks great outside too. All right, Kevin Bacon uh, showed up unannounced at a family's home. This was in Wisconsin. You mentioned this earlier, and they were just thrilled to see him too. That's because uh, it was a 450 pound pig that somehow got footloose and ran away. As Jeffrey Zampatti reports, he and the family became fast friends. Kevin Bacon is a gentle giant. He's a 450 pound pig who loves taking walks, meeting new people, and more than anything, eating donuts. Brighton resident Jake Mulgard was home Friday night when his wife discovered something unusual. Friday night around 8 o'clock I'm watching TV and my wife comes in uh, the room and says, Jake, I, I think there's a pig on our driveway camera. And I'm like, are you serious? Kevin Bacon was standing at their back door. He wandered from a nearby hobby farm and wanted to say hello. Mulgard made a few phone calls and found his owner, who was out of town for the weekend. Yeah, uh, that's that's definitely my pig. Is he? He's a big black pig. I said, yeah. He's like, yeah. His name is Kevin Bacon. And uh, he's actually a little lonely, so he's probably just looking for company. With some assistance from the Kenosha Sheriff's Department, the Mulgard family brought Kevin home, a one-mile walk that took an incredible two and a half hours. At one point, Jake's daughter, <laughs> Chloe, had to climb on Kevin's back to get him going. <laughs> the owner said that if, he's, if he stops on it, you can get jump on his back, and he likes to likes to run at that point. The Mulgards lured Kevin home with Oreo cookies and anything else they found in the fridge. Not only did they get him back home, they made a friend for life. They all wanted to adopt him immediately and I said we don't have a place to put a 450 pound pig but uh, yeah they they fell in love with him right away. Right there, that was Jeffrey Zampetti reporting. Coming up next at 4.30, uh, we're going to talk about rental regulations. The city of Birmingham uh, getting ready to make some changes in its short-term rental policy.
Welcome back in at 4.30. I'm Ian Wright. I'm Brittany Decker. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, it's been a pretty nice day out there today. Let's give you a live look outside of some clouds still lingering over the Magic City. Uh, if you take advantage of the weather um, today, this evening, maybe tomorrow, that's fine too. Friday is uh, going to bring in some rain though, some changes. What do we got to talk about with Friday? We've got an impact day, yep. heavy rain for a lot of the day. Some thunderstorms embedded in that and potentially some flooding by okay. the end of the day. So kind of just a messy day. At least right now we are seeing a clearing trend. This is a view from our Tuscaloosa camera and through the rest of the evening the sky will stay mainly clear. Could have some patchy fog by early tomorrow, but temperatures will be holding in the upper 40s and low 50s for morning lows tomorrow afternoon. We'll end up in the mid 70s. That's going to feel great. We do get a lot of sunshine and then Friday is our impact day. We'll highlight that day and show you that yes, widespread rain in the forecast. We could have one to three inches widespread with some localized spots picking up anywhere from two to four inches and then a very low end severe risk as we move uh, through the evening hours Friday. It's going to be one of those days where it rains Pretty much all afternoon and evening that rain exits early on Saturday. Here's a quick look at the timing uh, moving into West Alabama right around lunchtime spreading across the central part of our state through 3 p.m. And then by 6 o'clock our easternmost communities in on the rainfall that rain is with us through Saturday morning. We're going to time this out more and we'll talk more about that severe risk coming up in just a few. Brittany. All right, Taylor, thank you so much. Now is the time to download the WVTM 13 app if you have not done so already. Inside it is the weather section. So there you get some uh, free access to the only live Doppler in central Alabama. It's all yours again on our free WVTM 13 app. Birmingham police continue to investigate a weekend shooting that happened at a short term rental property. We're told that someone rented the house in the North Pratt community. At some point, more people showed up for a party. Eventually, shots were fired, killing a man. Right now, the city is working to create some kind of regulation when it comes to these short term rentals. WVTM 13's Lisa Crane live and local tonight. Lisa, this isn't the first shooting at a rented home. Yeah, that's right. That shooting over the weekend happened here at this short term rental on Dugan Avenue. But the owner of this property has another short term rental also in Birmingham that was the site of the shooting over the summer. Now, this latest incident has actually motivated the Birmingham City Council's interest in trying to regulate short term rentals in the city. Now, I spoke with a council member today who said they've been discussing what's to, what's what to do to get a handle on these rentals for more than a year. He says they reached out to the city's attorney to get input on ways to do that. We're not a home rule state, you know, and we really uh, are limited to what the state law allows us to do. And state law doesn't include a definition of what short term rental is. Um, so currently under state law, a rental is a rental is a rental. Now, O'Quinn says they're not looking to ban short term rentals. He says other municipalities that have done that. He feels like once those are challenged in court, those bans will be repealed. Live in Birmingham, Lisa Crane, WVTM 13. And down in Montgomery, two of the most talked about bills could get a vote tonight. The first is legislation that protects IVF services in Alabama. The House is expected to discuss the issue at any moment. If passed, it gives protections for people who provide in vitro services. Last month, the state Supreme Court ruled embryos could be considered children under state law. Three facilities paused their IVF treatments as a result. Brent, the other piece of legislation we're keeping a close eye on is a bill that would allow public entities and universities to dissolve their diversity programs. That as well could get a vote at any moment. We're keeping close tabs of this one. It's scheduled to be on the House floor right after the vote on the IVF bill. This is a critical piece of legislation. Supporters say it's divisive. Opponents argue it makes universities unwelcoming. If it passes the House, it goes back to the Senate for final approval. Another bill we are watching is one that could provide Birmingham Southern College some much needed assistance. The Senate sending the bill to the House where it'll go to committee. You'll remember the legislature approved funding for the school last year. However, the state treasurer decided not to give Birmingham Southern any money. The House will recess after today. BSC doesn't believe the bill will get a vote on the full House until March 19th. Gadsden is now home to the newest safe haven box here in the state. If you don't know about this program, it allows mothers who give birth to surrender their child anonymously. This is going to be put up at the fire station on Garden Street. And keep in mind, five babies have been surrendered statewide. That includes two in Madison this year. The city council is officially going to cut the ribbon on the safe haven box tomorrow. 
The future of the very popular Mobile Bay Ferry could be up in the air. Its parent company is filing for bankruptcy. If you've been down to the beach, you probably know what I'm talking about. It takes you from Dauphin Island over to Fort Morgan. And this company is uh, hoping to continue the service, though, as they move forward. All right, so if you're going to be traveling over the next couple of weeks, uh, keep a heads up on this. The TSA is expecting a busy spring break travel season. So starts tomorrow. The rush really goes through March 25th. Uh, last year, the agency screened a record number of passengers. So far this year, travel is up 6% from last year. Hey, speaking of the TSA, the agency is debuting new self-service screening. So here's how it works. The entire thing is done by you. It's automated. It allows TSA officers to keep eyes on security. For now, it's under a six-month trial in Las Vegas. They hope it's a faster way for folks to get right through security. All right, talking about the roads here, we're looking busy in the downtown area, 65 southbound, um, looking uh, pretty congested here. No accidents to report near the summit. We're seeing some busyness as well. Let's take a live look outside um, at the Tuscaloosa area right near Highway 82. Is that true? No, McFarland. We're going to take you to McFarland Boulevard right near 59 instead. Uh, we're seeing traffic is flowing nicely there. And hey, it looks beautiful out there too if you are driving home this evening. No delays in this area. We'll keep you updated with any changes. All right, so it's your time to shine. The Birmingham Barons want to hear from you. You can audition to perform the national anthem. We're going to take a look at how you can make your voices heard at Region Field coming up next. Lipscomb has the ball, a chance to tie it. Will Pruitt gets it to McCormick on the way. Put in the book. Now, so the Madness of March uh, isn't near. It's here. That shot came at the uh, A Suns quarterfinal between uh, North Alabama and Lipscomb. Yeah, unfortunately for uh, the Bison, it wasn't enough. Check out how North Alabama responded. Here comes KJ Johnson. Here comes North Alabama. Two seconds. Shot's going to be good. KJ Johnson has defeated Lipscomb on the run to the bucket. Crowd goes wild. Uh, to make it ma uh, matters worse for Lipscomb, the guy who hit the shot played three years before them before transferring 
to North Alabama. Was with them for a little while. We'll have the Lions play Austin P tonight in the semifinals. Oh, All right, so a month before opening day, the Birmingham Barons want you to audition to sing the national anthem. Auditions are tomorrow, 4.30 to 6 at Regents Field. If you can't make it, you're in luck. Send a video audition to the email on your screen. Opening day coming up next month, April the 5th. Here's a look at a few from past as well. <laughs> I recognize that How voice. How find that job? Was that you? Yeah, it was me. Nice, that was a nice good job. rendition of uh, God Bless America. That's cool. Not the national anthem, but hey, thanks for uh, Fun to be out there. finding that video, Alan. <laughs> we have much more coming up after the break. First of its kind, Union. Now moving forward at a distinct Ivy League university. How the decision from Dartmouth basketball team could impact all of collegiate athletics moving forward. Plus, uh, we have some news that we love elementary students in the area. Uh, getting a gift from a nonprofit, how the donations will help the care these kids put their best foot forward. And we have some weekend storms heading in our direction. Uh, Taylor is back to let us know how much rain will be dumped for us on Friday and on Saturday, too. Looks nice out there for now, but again, some changes on the way. Here's five things to watch out for. WTM 13 News at 5. New explosive detecting canines will soon be patrolling the airport in Birmingham. How these dogs could save a life. Scammers in Shelby County trying to extort money from victims by pretending to be deputies. We're taking a close look at what you need to know to protect your information. President Biden putting the final touches on his State of the Union speech tomorrow night. Coming up, we hear from Senator Tommy Tuberville what he has to say about one of the most important speeches of the year. Student protests in Montgomery just minutes before the House brings up the DEI bill for a vote. 
why they are voicing their concerns. And we are live and local in Coosa County where voters approved a first of its kind ambulance service, what it is and how it impacts everyone countywide. So that's one of the elections uh, that you may have missed. So here's a few more. So Amendment 1 was on the ballot. It was turned down by voters across the state. This would have removed a procedural step for local bills moving through the state legislature. Yeah, incumbent Twinkle Kavanaugh is a step closer to retaining her seat as the president of the State Public Service Commission. She won the GOP primary last night in a landslide. In the election for State Board of Education, Kelly Mooney will take the GOP primary in District 3. That covers Talladega, Shelby, Chilton, and Coosa Counties. In Alabama, we'll have a new Supreme Court justice. Sarah Stewart running away with the race a 61% of the vote. Right, so on the national stage, the presidential election is now down to two. Nikki Haley dropping out on the GOP side in the hours after her defeat here in our state and in most other Super Tuesday states as well. Neither Trump nor President Biden have reached the delegates needed to clinch the nomination. The former president could reach the magic number by next week. The incumbent is also close, needing about 400 more. And speaking of Mr. Trump, he wants a new trial in his defamation case. A judge ruling that he has to pay E. Jean Carroll $83 million. The Trump team wants the judge to cancel it altogether, arguing, quote, a district court may grant a motion for a new trial if the verdict is against the weight of the evidence. They also claim the penalty is excessive. A historic vote by the men's basketball team at Dartmouth College. The men's vote to unionize could have long-term impacts for student athletes around the country. As Sam Brock explains, the vote means the players could be considered employees. It's the dawn of a new day at Dartmouth. <laughs> After the men's basketball team voted 13 to 2 to become part of a union, with the National Labor Relations Board ruling last month the student athletes can be considered employees. Like our manager gets paid and has been getting paid for uh, three years, and, and you know none of us have seen a penny. Right before the vote, two Dartmouth players telling NBC's Maura Barrett that the prospect of negotiating salary and health insurance is a game changer. I've gotten injured here a couple times and had to pay for those like out of pocket. I know a lot of other people on the team have gone through the same thing and that and that can, you know, be a real burden. It's all about athlete empowerment. Darren Heitner teaches courses in sports law and NIL or name, image and likeness and says unlike the NIL shift, which has allowed athletes like Caleb Williams, Bronny James and the Cavender twins to make huge sums of money through endorsements. Collective bargaining has the potential to lift all athletes. You could have an athlete who earns absolutely no money in NIL, but if that same athlete is considered an employee of his or her university, the university can't get around negotiating a salary for that athlete. In 2015, Northwestern University football players also voted to unionize, only for that status to be overturned on appeal. And Dartmouth College is appealing, saying the school works productively with five unions, but athletic pursuit is part of the educational experience. Classifying these students as employees simply because they play basketball is as unprecedented as it is inaccurate. The AFL-CIO celebrating the vote, posting on X, NCAA athletes make billions in profits for the universities, and they deserve a seat at the table. This is the start of a new chapter in collegiate athletics. Still, the legal process could take months or years to complete. Oh, Sam Brock reporting. Well, back here at home, 200 students at Barrett Elementary have new shoes, thanks to FedEx and a national nonprofit. The school is just uh, one of 20 or so nationwide getting this donation. The hope is it helps to ease the burden for parents who are working through some difficult financial times. This moment means everything. We tell everybody to fill someone's bucket, and this is like bucket filling time in the now and happening right now. Well, since 2008, the partnership has helped deliver hundreds of thousands of shoes to families in need. All right, so we've been talking about this one, Britt. you got a special story you're working on about first responders that are really going above and beyond in probably one of the most meaningful ways. Yeah, and it's really a whole family mission, too, and a call to action. Front lines to foster families. They're answering the call to serve, and they're sharing their stories to speak of the great need for foster care in our state. God has given us the opportunity to welcome 23 children through our home. Our daughter, we... We fostered to adopt her. We have two adopted children uh, that are ours. Over 20 kids in our home. I'm so thankful that, that I stepped up and because uh, these kids, they, they, need, they need us. And, you know, you can't help them all. But if there's enough people that's willing to help just one, then that makes a huge difference in the numbers that are out there. 
This story is incredible. We spoke to four officers in the department who shared their journey. For one, uh, Chief Deputy Clay Hammock's journey with his family began out of tragedy. It was a murder of a little girl that ultimately led his family to uh, opening their hearts and their home to fostering children. Uh, they, they all agree, every single one we spoke to, that it's, it's a hard journey, but unquestionably it's worth it uh, taking that leap of faith to foster and just talking about the great need in our state to um, have other families hopefully open up their hearts to do, to do the same. And what a gift they're giving those children and helping them out during that time. Yeah, and, and they were also mentioning too, just having more empathy on the job, oh, maybe sure. understanding yeah. other people's stories and how they got into certain situations that they got into as well. So really nice story. Can't wait to share the full thing. That'll be at 10 o'clock tonight. Right, so we uh, got an impact day to talk about for us as we head toward the weekend. We do. Friday is going to be the day where we've got a lot of rain around. It starts during the afternoon, lasts through the evening, and eventually moves out of here early on Saturday morning. But right now, if you're about to head out for dinner, we're looking pretty good. We saw those clouds around for much of the day, but those have cleared on out of here. This is the view from our region's field camera. Through the rest of the evening, we do keep a mainly clear sky. And by early tomorrow morning, our temperatures are going to be dropping into the upper 40s and low 50s, and we bring in a little bit of patchy fog. It's not going to be everywhere, but for some folks, that visibility is going to be reduced on that morning commute. So you might want to build in a little bit of extra time for that morning commute. By tomorrow afternoon, we end up in the mid 70s, mostly sunny sky. Tomorrow is absolutely beautiful. It's going to be the warmest day through the rest of the week. So if you are enjoying the spring like temperatures, tomorrow is going to be your day. Um, if you enjoy the rain, Friday is going to be your day. We do have a lot of it in the forecast. In fact, it is an impact day with average rainfall totals across central Alabama, anywhere from one to three inches. Some localized spots could see more than four inches, and that could lead to some flash flooding possible by Friday evening. In addition to that, we've also got a very low end severe risk with those storms that move through Friday evening. Looking at our rainfall totals, we've highlighted this red region here. That's where we could see two to four inches of rain that looks most likely south of I-20. And that region, that red region, is also the most likely location for us to see the potential for some flash flooding with those totals exceeding four inches in some spots. So just know it's going to be a very wet day Friday, uh, starting around lunchtime, lasting into the evening hours. Rain eventually exits uh, by the early morning hours on Saturday. Any kind of severe risk mainly looks to be to our south within this yellow region here. That's a slight level two out of five risk, but you will see the green color across much of Alabama. That's a marginal level one out of five. Very low chance that we see a storm or two here that could produce gusty winds up to 60 miles per hour. An isolated brief tornado. Overall tornado threat, very low, but not zero. Make sure you've got a way to hear warnings just in case they're needed late Friday, lasting into early on Saturday. But I want to remind you once again, overall severe risk, very low. Higher threat to see a strong storm does look to remain to our south. Let's time it out as we move the clock forward during the day Friday, at least the first half of the day Friday. We're dry, but that all changes after about lunchtime. That's when we see better coverage of rain, very heavy rain at times through the afternoon into the evening hours. This is 6 p.m. So for the evening commute, we are dodging uh, those widespread downpours. It's about 9 p.m. that we'll start to watch for a few strong storms possible. That severe threat, that low severe threat lasting with us overnight and into the early morning hours on Saturday. Rain looks to exit after about 6 a.m. Saturday and then the rest of the day Saturday will be dry. Highs on Saturday reach into the upper 60s and then we are much cooler early on Sunday morning. Remember, of course, to set the those clocks forward before you go to bed uh, on Saturday evening and by Sunday evening or excuse me Sunday afternoon we have a high near 60 degrees so that's going to be a noticeable drop in those temperatures. Brittany. All righty we're taking a look at our traffic conditions here. We do have an accident that just popped up right near the Huffman area um, starting to cause some delays here 75 northbound right near Red Lane Road um, just coming up here on our traffic system. The downtown area is still looking really busy at this time 65 southbound um, average speeds right around 12 miles an hour and of course Highway 280 looking busy as well. Let's take you to 2059. Uh, look outside traffic is flowing nicely in this area. No accidents or incidents to report and a nice day and evening to drive home. We'll be right back after the break.
Hi, uh, yeah, last year Uber lifted the age restriction for kids to catch a ride or get food delivered by letting us, the parents, create teen accounts for kids ages 13 to 17. I love it. Now Uber is launching a new feature, which I also love, monthly spending limits. As the parent, you set a custom budget for their rides and their meals on Uber Eats individually. It renews every month. You get notified when the limit is reached for the rides and the Uber Eats. This is all on top of the safety feature that lets you track your teen from pickup to drop off in real time. If you're interested in setting up an account for your teen, head to the Uber app and I want you to click right over here, the account button in the bottom corner, then family and teens. Uber teen is available in a lot of cities across the country, expanding all the time. If you don't see the option on your Uber app, may not be available in your location yet, but Uber has a link where you can request the feature in your area. I'm gonna post that link and more, at rossonreports.com. Sloan and Blake, oh yeah, the spending limits are coming. Back to you. All right, so we got a wild story to tell you about. This is from Massachusetts. So listen to this, a guy there is suing the state because he says he ran smack dab into a parked Black Hawk helicopter. He's going after him for $9 million. Yeah, not good. Jeff Smith says that he was on a snowmobile when he hit the chopper. This was back in 2019. As you can see, landed him right in the hospital. At the time, the helicopter had been parked right there on the trail, waiting for the night training. The lawsuit accuses the government of not doing anything to illuminate the helicopter so Smith could avoid the crash. Uh, the government, though, blames alcohol that he drank for the crash. All right, so you have probably seen uh, this famous picture right here. This one, the Veteran, Air, uh, Veteran Affairs Secretary says VAs can display the image moving forward. The department memo initially banned it from being shown because it shows a sailor kissing a woman he may not have known. Fed Chair Jerome Powell believes the Federal Reserve will cut its key interest rates this year. It first wants to see more evidence that inflation is falling back to its 2% target. Inflation is in fact slowing for both goods and services. The question is how quickly the Fed reaches its goal.